Welcome to Novo Warrior. My name is CK Lin. This is a place where entrepreneurs talk about what it takes to create and scale purpose-driven organizations. We're going to talk about mindset. We're going to talk about mental models. We're going to talk about actionable tactics such that you can create and scale your purpose-driven organization. My name is CK Lin, former biomedical uh, engineering PhD from UCLA that turned founding members of our startup team that went from zero to 200 plus people that turned into executive coach for founders and entrepreneurs, specifically focused on their mindset and culture. My next guest is a former military officer, a former TED fellow, a, the founder of Giant Shoulders brand strategy firm. And he, his superpower is that he helps organizations to tell the stories of their big new idea to make the world a better place. Please welcome Tino Chow. Thank you for coming, Tino. Appreciate you. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for the uh, intro. I wanted to start with something simple. I'm actually quite curious about it personally. Yeah. Why did you name the company Giant Shoulders? Out, out of all <laughs> kinds of names that you can name it, how did the name come about? Yeah, so that's all the science and, uh, and art kinds of naming. And this is actually something that we do for clients. And one of the one of the things that uh, a good name kind of have to do, well, kind of one of the good, one of the things that a good name can do is to get people to pause and to reconsider. I was like, wait, what does that actually mean? So we kind of went down that route with the giant shoulders. It, it's a it's a bit of a cheeky name, but it does have a kind of a strong tie to kind of who we want to be and also who we kind of why we are here. So the the name actually comes from a a Newton quote, which says. If I've seen further, it's by standing on shoulders of giants. So we are here uh, as a kind of branding, brand strategy and design firm because of the giants that we got to stand our shoulders on, particularly like the design thinking kind of powerhouse kind of IDO, you have Frog Design, you have kind of Future Brand, and you know a lot of these other kind of agencies have really laid the foundation where design meets business, design meets leadership. So that is kind of, uh, kind of a, a nod to the past. And come moving forward, we want to be the giant shoulders that our clients can stand on to see further. Mm, I love that. Thank you. Now, now that it makes a lot of sense, instead of just a cute name, that actually does a lot of meaning. Yeah. It. So Thanks. you had mentioned the concept design and leadership together. Mm -hmm. So tell us what design and leadership mean for you. Yeah. So, and maybe something I'm going to start with is sort of the definition of design in relationship to art. And, and I went to art school. I'm actually teaching at Rhode Island School of Design right now. And you never really want to separate artists and designers uh, because everyone uh, that goes to art school or design school have uh, a bit of artist and designer in them. So, but to kind of split hairs, if I can, I'll cut here a little bit. Artists and designers, uh, and this is something that I have a mentor of mine. We had this conversation years and years ago over some whiskey, and we came up with this uh, kind of definition. So artists and designers are both problem solvers. The difference is that artists create their own problems to solve, and the designers kind of solve other people's problems, or they find joy in solving other people's problems. So that's sort of the definition, sort of the, 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 I think a big kind of difference between artists and designers. And one of the reasons why I want to kind of bring that up is that it is very similar to kind of what a leader does, right? Like, I mean, there's sort of different flavors of leaderships out there, but kind of my belief is that a leader exists to serve others. We're not that's externally, that's your clients, that your customers, your people that are influencing externally, and then you have your own team as well. And how does that overlap between kind of design where you're solving other people's problems versus kind of leadership where you end up, you know, you are trying to, in some ways, you're moving obstacles for your team so that they can perform at the highest level possible. Mm. Okay. So let, let's unpack that a little bit. Great. So what I heard is artists solve their own problems versus designers mm -hmm. help solve other people's problems. In my mind, entrepreneurs by nature, by, by its very nature is we're problem solvers or same as engineers, yep. same as many other ways. Right. And exactly. we create more value by helping more people solve their problems. I think mm -hmm. there's a quote in the personal development world. They say that you can get everything that you want when you help everyone else get what they want. Right. So it's very yep. similar to that. The challenge that I do see though, is 
a lot of the innovators that I talk to focus a lot on the widget, on the mechanism mm -hmm. that's going to help delivering the value rather than talking to the end users that what the customers actually want. Yes. More, more of a Steve job type approach, right? Hey, my customers don't even know what they want. So I'm just going to focus on my widget and making the best possible. And when I'm done, yeah, the world will be so impressed by this sophistication of my solution mm -hmm. that often doesn't happen. So I'm curious to know your point of view regarding, uh, are you more of a user center design, human centered design, or are you more of a yeah. job esque type approach? I think a little bit of both. And you know, the field that I'm in is branding and I think it's, it's a lot of times it's about kind of connecting those two worlds is that you have to have deep conviction, right? To, to, to start a company, to go through the trouble of starting a company, having to go around and, and oftentimes convincing your friends and family first, right? To put in money, uh, to believe in your vision and then go out and ask investors for that money. And then ask or come in, in the process, ask for early adopters to believe in your idea or believe in your product. So I think that's a lot of, it takes a lot of guts and a lot of self-belief to be an entrepreneur, to, to, to say that, you know, even if the world is not ready, or maybe sometimes it's consciously or subconsciously, can we say that as like, even the world, if the world is not ready, I believe that what I'm doing has intrinsic value. I'm going to continue investing in it. And at some point in time, <laughs> people mm -hmm. are going to see the value. So I think that's on the one end of like the Steve Jobs-esque of like, you know, the world may not be ready, but I'm going to show the world. I mean, it takes mm -hmm. a lot of guts and then maybe the fine line is a lot of ego uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of kind of human-centered design and how this is related to kind of branding uh, and the way that uh, we approach branding is taking a more of an MVP kind of agile kind of, a, kind of approach where we do want people's feedback. But at the same time, getting feedback, getting, getting people on board without a direction, that's not mm -hmm. true leadership, you know? And I think one of the, the very, one of the, I would say tragic stories that I myself experienced and over and over again, I hear a lot of entrepreneurs after years of building something and wake up and, and hates going to work. They forgot mm -hmm. why they started their business. Not to say that listening to their customers is a bad thing but they never quite written down why they started the business. What is their vision that they want to bring everybody along and given and not just be totally succumb to the wills and the wants of um, their customers, because sometimes customers may not want to go where you want to go. And at that's and oftentimes leaders or entrepreneurs don't make that decision. Don't make the conscious decisions like, okay, if I'm going to go where the customers are going, it might not lead to where I want to go. If I'm okay with that, great. That's a compromise that I am making. But oftentimes leaders or entrepreneurs, we might be chasing, subconsciously chasing the wrong things. Like, okay, the next kind of round of funding, the valuation. And as we follow that, we start to step further and further away from your original vision. And in many ways, from your kind of authentic brand, and starting mm -hmm. to move towards somewhere that you don't recognize. And it's always those small steps. And it's like those small steps and you keep adding those small steps. And eventually you come, you, you wake up one day and like, why am I doing this? I don't even um, recognize the company that I, I once built or I wanted yeah. to build. Yeah, exactly. So this yeah. is a very long winded question uh, along with an answer that um, I'm pretty sure we, I may have answered your question, but uh, no, I, it, it's actually really great. I, I think you, I think for most podcasts or books or the egoic mind wants a very clear black and white mm. answer just do this ta -da, yeah. life will turn out but really life is in paradox it's in opposite polarities you don't just have one side of a coin you have Absolutely. both sides it's always the answer is somewhere in the middle so the way that i ask my guests to have this type of conversation is to tease out the nuance just the difficult things that they had to grapple with such that they come to a, a decision, a, a choice that actually matters mm -hmm. most. Yeah. So I think your answer was perfect. Thank you for that. Yeah, One you. of the things that I share over and over again, on this podcast is I often use driving as a way to illustrate going through life. You have your mm -hmm. North star of the place that you want to go. And then you have a GPS device that tells you left turn or right turn, right? Based sure. on external input. 
And but oftentimes, you do, if you just focus on the GPS, the external feedback, a yeah. lot of, sometimes it does guide you to the wrong direction. So it's important that you do have that internal rubric of, hey, this is the direction we want to go. Here are my core values. Just because I believe in this, because yeah. I want to do it, I'm the founder. This is my vision, and then then you can take the external data points and then whether or not to 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 guide this vehicle that you're driving towards your vision and or following your customer's advice. So what you yeah, say? Yeah, absolutely. But let's actually back up for a moment, zoom out for a mm -hmm. second. Right here's one thing that I deeply believe in. <clears throat> our superpower often comes from our biggest wounds. So are there any kind of specific challenges that you face in the past, such that enable you to say, I'm going to focus on branding. I'm going to focus on storytelling. This is the path that I wanted to go no matter what. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I, I think I've been in in my short career more failed startups than successful ones, uh, and oftentimes in failure you learn you you learn more in failure than you you do in success. And I, I think I'm maybe to back up kind of in my own journey kind of a little bit. So one one of the decisions that that I made that I have to make is actually joining the military, and I, and I did that in Singapore. So I didn't grow up in the U.S. I grew up in Hong Kong but I was a Singapore citizen. Hmm. So at the age of 18, I had to make a decision. Actually, at the time I was 17, I had to make a decision when not. I, I want to give up my Singapore citizenship and go pursue kind of what, I, what I wanted to pursue then or join the military and then go to college. And the, the decision in a way was made for me because the Singapore government is, is pretty smart that my parents had to pay a a savings bond essentially every year for the every year uh, for every year that I was out of the country. So which came to a tiny sum of money that I could choose any college that I could go to if I joined the military or I can so choose quote unquote my freedom and not join the military and but have a very limited a limit kind of uh, set of options. Mm -hmm. I'm and one of those things where when you're 17 <laughs> You don't think too clearly. I mean, you think the world, you, you think that you know everything in the world. So I did struggle with that kind of a little bit, but eventually it, it became clear as like, if I really want to kind of be a designer, I really wanted to go to the best design school. Kind of, and in my mind at the time, and even now, I, I, I believe that Rhode Island School of Design was the best design school. So at the, at the time, I was like, okay, fine, I'm going to suck it up and, and go join the military. You know, spent two, two and a half years of my life kind of there, even though I did not grow up in Singapore. I grew up in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. I'm going back to kind of where I was born. I have family there, but it was a very foreign concept when you, when you don't come from that culture where you're prepared. Every one of your friends are going into the military, so you know what to expect. So, so I didn't really know what to expect going in, which turns out that like I'm now, you know, hindsight is always 2020. It's one of the, the, the most pivotal decisions that I've, I've made kind of uh, going in and, and also deciding specifically that if I'm going to be there for two and a half years, I, I, I might as well just make the most out of it. And at the point I'm like, well, I'm just going to try to climb the ranks as high as I can. And so I have at least something to show for it. Little did I know that that experience of becoming selecting, being selected as a officer cadet and then graduating as a as a lieutenant actually taught me a lot more than I would have ever bargained for. And it's whenever I talk to any veterans, kind of, no matter what country they come from, all of us have one thing in common: is that all of experiences, when not we have been in active kind of war zone it keeps the training that we got the mindset you know and, and i know that's something that that, that we talk about uh, that you talk a lot about here the mindset and the the tool the tool set and the leadership perspectives that you get will never leave you and it keeps coming back to help you and sometimes haunt you uh, throughout your life mm. would you say to other people having kids you are a new father would you mm -hmm. want to give your kid this choice of joining a military school, a military experience, having gone through it yourself? Yeah, I think this is, I mean, I, I feel like perhaps in the, in the U.S. is a kind of, it's a little bit more of a divisive kind of a question. 
in, in Singapore, it wasn't really a choice if I was a citizen, if I grew up there, it's like, well, it, if you don't join, you're basically going AWOL and you can go to prison. So yeah, less of a choice. I don't give you a choice there. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> but I would say, yeah, I, it, it's a tough question as a, as a father now, like I, I have a 16 month old daughter. So mm -hmm. it, it's so a long way away from her, you know, even thinking about anything like this remotely. But I, I think of some of these choices that we, that we do make, like you said, like I've, you know, life is a bit of a meandering kind of route. And I think I, one thing that I can do for her as a father, as a parent is to uh, be able to instill kind of good, good North Star, like a good direction and help her define her set of values. And this is something that, you know, that's very kind of ironically kind of, well, maybe less ironically, uh, kind of similar to the work that I do as a brand strategist. It's it's all about helping kind of leaders and helping companies find the guiding values, understand where the North Star is and using those guiding values to get there because the world is unfair. You know, things are going to get thrown at you. Maybe perhaps at the time where I was uh, I was given a choice to join the military, I was probably thinking that this is the, 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 the most unfair decision that I have to make. But that's, that is life. And you just have to prepare yourself kind of for whatever uh, comes your way and, you know, and remember and know your values. I think this is something that kind of within kind of companies or startups that we, we work with and even mature companies and leaders that, you know, we think we know what our values are, but we have never once kind of really written it down. And sometimes we don't, we can't even recall it off the top of my head. Let's actually talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. Value the clarity around one's value. So different schools of thought, right? Mm -hmm. One school of thought is let's just do some exercises or, sure. you know, paper exercises, group exercises, meditation, visualization, psychedelic mm -hmm. experience even, right? So then such that sure. you can reflect upon your past experience and based on the past, mm -hmm. let me write it down to intellectual exercise. Another school of thought is, well, it's not useful to do the paper exercise. It's actually more useful to put yourself in new situations, whether it's martial arts or the military yeah. or physically challenging things. And you discover it in the moment of adversity versus sure. looking through the past. Curious to know your thoughts around how do you actually help uh, your clients clarify their values? Yeah, so we do. That, that's a great question. I think those two perspectives not mutually exclusive and i think this is one thing that we we use both of those things are things that we use so our methodology of, in branding is called minimal viable brand we blatantly like stolen that. the I name like from yeah. minimal viable products yeah but with any product it's like or any brand you, you have to go out into a world announcing something right like you can't just say hey i'm just here learning about the world and if you want to buy my product you want to buy into what i do uh, sure, but I can't really tell you who I am. So that's the that's perhaps the least effective way of launching any brand, launching any product. You have to be able to clarify kind of well, why do you exist? Even if the why only resonates kind of with you, you have to be able to describe that to people. And then as you build that brand, as people come in and kind of determine and determine kind of who you are and why you exist, you can then either kind of absorb that. Well, firstly, you have to evaluate when not it's uh, where you want to go, similar to the conversation that we have earlier, where you want to go, if this is really who you want to be and evaluate when not this is um, part of my brand that I want to build. Because at the end of the day, kind of what branding does is help people define kind of their perception of you. If you don't control that, people are just going to create their own perceptions. And as we kind of may know, our perceptions is our reality. Like the way that I see a certain brand. Wait, one sentence. Yes. Interesting statement you just made. All perceptions are reality. Say more about that. So I think more specifically, your perception is your reality. I see. How you perceive the world is what you believe is true. Gotcha. So, and this is kind of where branding and kind of marketing kind of really kind of, kind of tie in together is that you can be true to who you are and not tell anyone and let people make up their minds of who they think you are, then you're not really in control of, of, of your own your own authenticity and your own story. So there's this kind of, um, kind of marriage between branding and marketing where you know, how do you actually socialize that? How do you how does your brand show up um, in adversity? How does your brand show up in, in the greatest need? 
And I think mm -hmm. right now in this time is one of the best examples where come to, where some brands step up in the pandemic and others kind of just fade away and like almost seem to be completely irrelevant in this time. So, you know, going back to sort of the, the idea of we're not in adversity, you find your values. I, I think that's absolutely true. But also at the same time, I think adversity or kind of even in good times, right? Like it's a great place to test and uh, validate your values. And I think the authenticity of brands oftentimes come from come from leaders who are willing to put to put the necks out there. And it's like, hey, this is what we believe in. And even if the world disagree with us, this is why we do what we do. We're going to stand up for for the weak. We're going to stand up for the poor, even if if um, other people around us don't believe it. But because we do, we are going to do what we do. And you know. We're going to get some noise. We're going to get people who, who would who would throw stones at us, but we're going to stay true to ourselves. So come with that said, and going back to some kind of, uh, kind of your original question in terms of doing exercises, developing your set of values, and then testing it. Absolutely. I think both. And this is kind of our minimal viable branding process. And oftentimes with, our, with the leaders that we that we work with, I mean, really with anyone who is an adult who has, who has lived a few years, you, there are going to be those points in time. And even when you, when you ask me the question of that's the greatest pain where we, where it kind of like it really defined who I am, um, like you can start to find elements of kind of what you truly value. What were the things that the decisions that you made, how would it make you feel? And if you would do it, if you were to do it again, will you do it differently? We can start to kind of parse out what are some of those values and the things like you, it might be adrenaline that made you do whatever you do and you might overthink it. And, and this is something that as a strategy, uh, as a strategist, I do all the time. I overthink things all the time. So that's where the discipline of, okay, let's take a step back and make sure that we have kind of uh, people or within your team or with kind of in the larger world that has a different perspective or a, a, a non-biased you know, quote, unquote, non-biased perspective to give you genuine feedback of who you are, are those values really you, or you're trying to be someone who you are not? Man, there's a, there's a lot of things I can unpack. Let me unwind for a few Great. minutes, see if I can, see if I can recap everything that you just said. Okay. So what I hear is this, one needs to know oneself first mm -hmm. before, yes, and then you can do that for a corporate entity that's made out of a lot of different individuals, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, what a brand is, it's not the external things that you can, it's a felt experience, essentially. It's a feel felt experience. That's what yeah. a brand is. It's not the, hey, we just, you know, pass widgets around kind of a thing, right? So with Absolutely. that uh, said, you illustrate what I was trying to get to perfectly. Uh, adversity reveals our character. Adversity gives us an opportunity to either show up or dissipate altogether. Mm -hmm. I think you, you said that beautifully in the COVID example. You also had said, right, so this is a chance giving, let's say COVID, that's here now, mm -hmm. is a chance for us to really double down on what we truly believe in or Absolutely. not. So. Here's a question for you. What, how do I articulate this? How do I tease this out? Right. So in, in, in the minimal viable brand, mm -hmm. it's, so you, you talk to your clients. This is not a finished product. This is a snapshot, a draft, so to speak, as we yes. are launching this, as we're testing this out. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that it's not driven by strategy? Because strategy is pure cerebral. This is our opportunistic versus yeah. authentic felt, hey, we're going to stand behind this no matter what. How do you discern for them? Because doing, especially at a time where you're meeting challenges, it's easy to say, screw the felt experience, screw this value that we say, and just yeah. go with the opportunistic thing because we need to save for payroll as an example. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, leaders right now, business leaders, organizational leaders, and any kind of different level, come when you own a small business or a large corporation, so many, so many of them are making extremely tough decisions. Um, and oftentimes they end up kind of making sort of 
essentially less of two evils. And it's like either way, you're really challenging your resolve as a leader as what you, in terms of what you believe in. So, and I'm definitely not envious of, of, of that situation. We have a couple of clients and also participate in a couple of different kind of, kind of Zoom meetup groups nowadays that we come across quite a few kind of leaders who are quite deep in thought and also kind of just like, you know, go home and cry at, at, at night. It's just like, oh my goodness, I have to go let go. A, a good number of people who have been kind of loyal, trusted partners, soldiers that have been alongside and... I have failed them. I think that's that's something that I have come up over and over again. However, you know, when when you talk about sort of that that felt experience, I think one of the things that comes to my mind, and we love using quotes in my company because there's always something that uh, someone have said that is much more that comes from a much more credible source and sounds way smarter than we can we can frame it. And one of which is uh, Maya Angelou, who once said, "People will forget what you say, people will forget what you do, but they will never forget how you make them feel." And I start basically all of my branding kind of talks with that. It's like if you fall asleep, if you don't remember anything I, that I that I say, remember that because you know you're absolutely right there. That that is the essence of brand. It's a relationship that you're building with people, and even if you have to make a tough decision, it, it is. In a single moment, you can judge. You can judge people based on a single action that they that they take. But, but I think of with people the same way as brands. When you look at the trend of kind of who they are, who they kind of the decisions that they have to make, and I guess like the brand that they they kind of expose. They all there's oftentimes a pattern kind of over time. So kind of connecting comes out with a couple of things we talked about as well in terms of authenticity. It's like, well, you can fake having some some values, but how long is that going to last? And you can start to see cracks and also not just cracks, but a pattern of kind of um, not living up to those values. So once again, going back to some kind of something that we said before, is that kind of that's where the the the, the strategy starts to break down if you don't test and you don't update that strategy. It's like you can go out and make a lot of assumptions. Um, and this is generally what strategy is, is like you make a bunch of assumptions based on existing data and based on existing behavior. And you're predicting that if you kind of occupy this space in the world and move in this direction and show people and help people kind of form a specific perception of you, this is gonna help you succeed. And most of the time, and this is sort of the open secret of kind of strategy, is like most of the time we are wrong. <laughs> But it's not about kind of just being right or wrong in a specific moment, but it's like the, the discipline, very much like a scientist of like knowing exactly kind of what your uh, hypothesis is. And you go out and test a hypothesis. And if it's right, great, let's move on. But oftentimes there are uh, things that might be just slightly off or completely off, but you have a point of reference in terms of why it didn't work, why it worked adjust your hypothesis. And I think that adjusting a hypothesis is important because firstly, you need to filter it through your own own values. You need to filter it, uh, filter through whether or not that's authentically you. And also, kind of, is this where you're going? Update the hypothesis, go out and test it again, and keep doing that over and over again. There's many things that I can, I can unpack, but I do want to ask a tactical question here. Brand is a felt experience, right? So then what do you measure, right? Because it's not just the number of views on videos, because those are a proxy indicators of the felt experience. Yeah. But how do you actually, what do you measure in terms of brand? Yeah. So this is definitely, that, that's a, that's a really good question. This is something that, that we are still in the journey of exploring. I think the the ripple effect of brand is way more, way easier to measure. So uh, a lot of using very simple kind of marketing tools, we often kind of help leaders and entrepreneurs start to measure the effectiveness of uh, a brand through messaging or through uh, kind of marketing, A-B testing. Like those are very tangible tools that we basically borrow from marketing to test out a brand with a community. I think the other thing that we tend to do. Oh, you, lo you is, totally lost me there. So I, 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 what I heard is you use marketing tools to to test, but what do you test? So I have the. Not to uh, put you on the spot, by the way. The, yeah, we're totally. we're inquiring here. I'm not looking for a specific, you know, like a, a snapshot answer type thing. I'm just curious, like, 
what is it that we test? You, if brand is this intangible felt experience. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. I, and I think the, the second order of, of the felt experience is we're not people are willing to follow and, and not to kind of reduce it down to simply like how many followers do you have on like social media, but that is an indicator. And once that again, a brand, affinity, like some kind of affinity yeah. towards this, I see. Okay. Yeah. And also, I mean, a big part of leadership does come down to kind of when are people willing to take action, people kind of willing to kind of, well, going back to kind of following or, you know, kind of clicks and downloads, buying kind of a product, all those can be used as a measurement for brand, uh, mm. but also can be, you know, and I think this is where it has, you have to be very, very careful in terms of if you're looking at sales number alone. Mm -hmm. Now, from an accounting perspective, it's like, well, if sales gone up, you know, you have a more successful business. Mm -hmm. Sure. As you're, and, and if you can take a step back and be able to measure kind of if your product kind of reaches, help you measure your, or kind of help you uh, reach your, or expresses your value and help mm -hmm. you take steps towards your goal, you can start to to create different kinds of measurements for different departments of your business to be, be able to create specific uh, measurable outcomes. And this is kind of, and I'll, I want to kind of uh, take a little bit of step back and, and, and talk a little bit about that because uh, kind of from a strategy perspective, a brand is your unwavering truth of kind of who you are. And mm -hmm. if you're able, if you're a leader and you're able to communicate that to all your lieutenants or all mm -hmm. your staff and allow them to uh, and basically create a framework that allows them to make decisions in their job based mm -hmm. on that truth and being able to, to then measure that, that decision when not it helps get you closer to that. And the things like sometimes those measurements uh, are the wrong things to measure. Mm -hmm. But once again, it's less about when not you're always right Mm -hmm. Like in every single decision, we're not, there's, there's a black and white, we're not it's right or wrong, but it's a, it's a trajectory towards, towards your end goal, towards your vision. That's way more important because as leaders, you want to create some space for other people to bring their superpower to fill in kind of what fill in with their own strengths. And you want to create the space kind of for them to thrive because oftentimes we are very limited at what we are really good at. And we don't have so the the peripheral vision that a lot of kind of your team might bring to the table and can make not just make the company better but makes you better. So when it goes back to kind of just what you know come to your point of like how do you measure it? You know, having kind of your unwavering truth and being able to kind of create a framework for other people to create their own ways of measuring kind of what create their own ways of measuring how they're helping move the business or the vision forward. That is a way more important framework than what is the tactical, like the very specific tactical way of measuring it. If that makes sense. It does. Let me actually take a step back real quick. Cause I, sure. what I realized is that we're kind of going meta meta, right? We're talking sure. about individuals and we're going to the organizational at the same time yeah. in like parallel. So let me yep. do a quick recap of the personal. Then you tell me, Great. is there anything you want to address that? And then we can go to organization. Okay. So that way it's more clear versus going parallel. Okay. Sure. So on the, in, on the personal, what I believe is we're on this journey to going closer and closer to our truth. As much as I like to say, this is my truth, 100% committed. That's sure. just not the case for me personally. It's we just... We're going closer and closer to our truth based on our intention and based on our words and actions. Yeah. Yep. And how authentic we are is based on the words and action that we give. And what you said earlier is right to, to declare to myself and to others, what values do I stand for? That way it's easier for others to say, I know it's not about Oh, what you say or what you do, it's how you make me feel. But having these declarations, words and actions makes it easier for them to identify, oh, now I know how I feel because X, Y, and Z. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's, okay. uh, that's perfect. All right, cool. So that gives me more of an internal compass. Here's my North Star to the best of my ability, mm -hmm. articulating words and actions, values, 
this is what I'm going to do. Here's my daily rituals to reinforce that. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Anything else you want to say on the personal before I move on to the organizational? No, I think, I think that's a, that's a great, great summary. I might have to hire you to, to explain it to my, to my clients. Yeah, actually, I want to give one more metaphor, which I really, yeah. really love our intentions and ideas mm -hmm. or our consciousness is like a single candlestick. Now by itself, it means it's just light. There's nothing yep. pure awareness, but through our words and actions is as if now there's motion around it. So in the motion that you see in the dark is a circle, let's say, right. Mm -hmm. But once it's still the circle disappear altogether in, in the, in the spiritual parlance, that's the patterns of words and actions. So when no words, no actions, then there's just emptiness, pure awareness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So similarly <clears throat> in the organizational sense, it's very similar when there's no words or actions behind it, it's just empty words, empty promise, but based on a patterns of one's words and actions, then you can start to see whether or not their words and actions align with what they say they're committed to. Absolutely. Agree? Okay. Yeah. Cool. So organizationally, similarly, it's very important to have declare values and rituals and operational techniques to, sorry, not techniques, implementation mm -hmm. to, to allow your lieutenants to actually also make this different decisions. So that way Absolutely. it's more of a scale rather than just a top down, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. Right. And then in the actions and implementations and the experimentation, then the, the consumer, so who the tribe, the community that you want to attract can make a decision for themselves. Hey, I have certain affinity towards this and let me follow it. Let yep. me uh, engage with it. Let me make purchasing decision with it. Is that accurate in terms of yeah. the way that you will measure it? Exactly. Okay, cool. Anything else you want to say around the organization side of things? I don't know if we're, we're heading this way, but there's definitely kind of this idea that I, I did this event and somebody, kind of one of my guests kind of said this, where there's so much focus kind of, um, on culture, which is not a bad thing, but there's so much focus on finding people to join your team that's a culture fit. And one thing that he kind of challenged us to think about, especially in the context of this call and this kind of this conversation is rather, I think a more useful way of thinking about culture in terms of building teams is about culture ad and not culture fit. Interesting. Um, say, say a little bit more about that. What do you mean? ADD like ad? Culture okay. ad versus culture fit. Okay. And I think this is something that is very much the, uh, perhaps comes the, the way that I view lead leadership where it, it's about making other people successful. And I think in one way you can look at your culture as something that you own exclusively as a leader. This is my culture. I'm going to set the rules. If you don't mm -hmm. like it. That's fine. You, you don't have to be part of it. Mm -hmm. However, this is one thing that I've come to kind of realize and learn about myself and, and, and a lot of kind of the, as I work with different people kind of in different industries all around the world is that I have some giant blind spots. I, I kind of know that. And I also know that I have other blind spots that I don't even, I'm not even aware of yet. Um, and the best thing to do is to surround yourself with people who uh, are smarter than you are and have um, different perspectives that complements kind of yours. And in a way kind of that fits into that sort of culture add kind of perspective of if you're bringing somebody on board, they, they can either be a drone. I mean, this is an extreme example of being a drone and do exactly what you tell them to do. That means, you know, that they, all they're adding is kind of a, a body and being able to uh, kind of carry out tasks. And then on the other kind of a kind of spectrum of kind of leadership and, and management is how, how do you bring in somebody who adds value and multiplies kind of, uh, the work that you do and that you are doing collectively? So I think that's sort of the, the helpful kind of framework of like culture add versus culture fit, because every time you bring in a personality, I mean, you're bringing in a human, they, they will bring, you know, they bring the good and the bad. That's just the, just human nature. 
but how does that whenever that happens whether whether you like it or not whether you have this like tight culture that you are controlling it's going to start to throw things off so if you there's two options two paths that you can take one is that you can clamp it down and just kind of try to micromanage and control the other is like well like how does this actually help make you better how do you leverage that that kind of instability for the greater for the greater good and for the for the for the collective yeah no i love it <clears throat> So as someone who was responsible for our culture, when we grow a startup, when I first entered it, the founding team, the founder and I, we were thinking in terms of let's, let's engineer the kind of culture that we want. Let's architect it. So here's a blueprint, yeah. here's a framework, here's a drywall, here's painting, here's the artifact, this and that, right? Yeah. And we soon learned that that didn't work. We got to think about it in more of an organic way. And then, Absolutely. then we started thinking about, okay, is it like a, a model culture? Mm -hmm. Like here, if you don't fit our yeah. culture fit, though it's in value, you don't belong, you know, A, a players only. Mm -hmm. Then we also soon learned that, okay, so model culture didn't work either. <laughs> we got to think in terms of a diverse garden, like a rich ecosystem. Sure. Right. So it's not just the cultural fit that we're looking for. The cultural app we're looking for is mm -hmm. how do we actually allow this rich ecosystem to flourish? So I don't certainly don't have an answer here, but I think it depends on the different stages where the company is at. Yeah. If, if we start off with a rich, diverse thought in the very beginning, that was no good. Because we mm -hmm. needed to be, let's bring in some military references, be like, you know, Neo, uh, CO Team 6. It needs to be yeah. like specialized skill. You just do the job in a very competent way. There's no back and forth bickering about different ideas, right? In the beginning. But as we grow and grow into a bigger, bigger company, we had to allow that diversity to come in so we can make sure that this pluralistic point of view gets represented yeah. we don't actually have giant blind spots love to hear yeah that. well i i i would so respectfully kind of disagree but also at the same time like i, I think this is one of the, the parts of culture that you we had um, you're going back to something that we talked about values it's a trial and error I, i've hired the wrong person so many times so many times and kind of just, and also watching kind of a lot of leaders kind of around me, a lot of entrepreneurs and business kind of leaders who I work with again and again, hire kind of the wrong person. But once again, I feel like, so let me ask you this, let me, let me quick, quick, what, mm -hmm. like what's wrong, like define wrong from your point of view. I, I think there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. So I mm -hmm. think it really does going back to kind of what you said, it's like, it, it does depend what stage you are at and uh, kind of who you're bringing in. You know, if you try to hire a philosopher kind of, uh, as your as your first hire, it's like good luck. Like you need to get stuff done. <laughs> so I definitely, I have made that mistake. I was like, ooh, wow, you think alike, and then and, and we ended up having two people thinking and no one actually doing. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's not actually a great fit. Mm -hmm. And then then on the other kind of side of like you know the fast growing startups where you know it's easy, it's almost too easy to just throw money at at hiring and just it's just a number count you know there is no structure or purpose behind kind of culture fit or culture ad it's like hey i need 10 engineers great what kind all right mm -hmm. i'm just gonna kind of turn on this pipe they're gonna come through and you know maybe there's lack of, kind of management uh kind of system lack of account of cultural accountability and the mm -hmm. ceo is still the one who is a bottleneck of making decisions like great bodies is not going to really help so I think, you know, just going back to specifically your question in terms of the wrong hire, the wrong hire could mean very different things in very, in, in all stages of a, of a business. But I think something that is in common with a lot of leaders who I respect is that it, they're not immune to making bad hires, but they learn. And I think this is one thing that, that does separate out, uh, separate a lot of the kind of good leaders from great leaders, mediocre leaders uh, uh, with good leaders. It, it's all that learning, ever learning process of like, okay, we have tried something out and it's like, okay, let's be able to take a step back and have a discussion or even 
simply admit to that that was a bad idea <laughs> and this is what we can learn from and and move forward so the same person who who introduced me to the idea of culture ad and culture fit he ran a uh, a startup and then got funding got booted out as as a founding team then went to work for another startup got funding and then wanting to shield his kind of engineering team from rest of the company and didn't work and then tried a third time kind of uh, trying to kind of build good culture and failed failed three times and and every time he he vowed to not make the same mistake again which he technically didn't just that the results were exactly the same and so but one thing that I do respect kind of him a lot is like how he kept he kept he kept at it it's like this is extremely important this is something that eventually I'll get right and eventually this is going to be this is what's going to make or break a, a company so I think this is that's much more imp- important trait kind of as we kind of hone in and talk about leadership than it is like how do you avoid making a mistake mm. let me actually share what I gather from what you just share okay sure um, he had a, a vision that he has around mm-hmm. culture and he is adamant he is determined he's committed to fulfill that. And what I hear is he's open-minded about his approaches. Mm-hmm. So he's not fixated on it. This has got to be a, you know, let me use the hammer to make this work every time. Right. So sure. he would just change different approaches to yeah. do it, even though in quote unquote, he's failed to produce the outcome that he uh, is committed to, but he is learning uh, different methods, different tools, different approaches to really yep. help him in his next approach. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the, the classic book that uh, Carol Dweck wrote that's mm-hmm. called Mindset, mm-hmm. the difference between a fix and a growth mindset. So yeah, it is a choice for a lot of people in terms of where not to follow into a fixed mindset kind of path or a growth mindset path. Yeah, I think that I don't actually exactly know where, where we disagree on because in my mind, it's very similar. <laughs> So, uh, but, but sure. without going down the rabbit hole further, what I do hear yeah. is no matter what the framework that you believe in, whether it's culture fit of culture ad or yeah. engineering or monoculture or diverse culture, whichever parlance, whichever mental model that you use, what yeah. I do hear we agree on is keep an open mind, keep mm-hmm. testing, and then keep going after this vision that you have around this culture, this felt experience. Because in my mind, the way I articulate mm-hmm. to people is culture is the soul, is the personality of your company. It is yeah. not something that you can just point to an artifact and say, that's our culture. Well, mm-hmm. yes, that's a representation of your personality, but it's not yeah. it, right? Would you agree yeah. to the way Absolutely. I frame our <laughs> conversation yeah no totally and I, I think that 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 kind of encapsulates kind of a, a big part of how we view brand and things like with brand like you ask 50 people on the street you probably get 50 different answers but got to us is that it's a culture in the soul it's trying to describe something that is very hard to describe and in a way it's like how do you measure a soul right like that's the how you do you know, measure the love uh, your mother has for you yeah like, uh, retention <laughs> rate. Feelings uh... different ways. <laughs> <laughs> no exactly and, and yeah, so that, that's something that is an, an ongoing, I, I mean, it's a, it's a great ongoing kind of discussion around like, how do you actually measure it? Because you know, the, the more that you can, the more that, not to say that you can simply replicate it, but you can also continue to improve your own culture because there's always room for improvement. Beautiful. So let's bring it to the tactical business mm-hmm. owner, entrepreneur, founder. Yeah undergoing tremendous stress right now due to yeah worry about their health, worry about their relationships, worry about the company, mm-hmm. worry about the market, a lot of things. Worry about the world, right? So we can go from the very small to the very large. Yeah. You had made a point that brand and leadership is extremely important right now. Mm-hmm. Let's bring it down to the practical. What can they do to solidify their brand yep. and then turn this from a crisis to an opportunity. Yeah, that's a, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I I have a a couple of thoughts there. I think number one, I do this kind of leaders kind of reflection kind of meet up every Tuesday 
uh, and we open that conversation around the Chinese word for crisis. And it's made of two characters. One is that the first is danger, and the second one is opportunity. And it's sort of the recognition of both kind of at any given time in a crisis. So when you're talking about like how do you turn the crisis into an opportunity, it's almost kind of built into that concept, which is something that we we all are holding on to and balancing kind of through through the coronavirus kind of crisis right now. And just to kind of, uh, and I think one thing that have also become clear is that, and I don't know kind of whose framework this is, but but we we discussed this as well in terms of react, reset, and renew. As so the three phases, three phases as you go through a crisis. I think you know we have a lot of us are in that reaction mode or come, starting to come out of reaction mode. It's like okay, now the dust is starting to settle. You know, kind of oh, what is the new normal. Okay, now I'm going to have a little bit of breathing room. And before you go out and renew and uh, kind of seek the opportunity and double down is first. Reset. Reset. So before you kind of get into that stage of let's pounce on the opportunity, kind of making sure that you're kind of regrounded because you just spent so much energy putting out a fire, you know, before going out and finding out, pursuing opportunity, recenter yourself. I think this is one of those things where it's so critical with with any brand, with any with any leader. It's like before you do more, because there's always more to do. And I'm I'm still preaching to myself too, because this is something that I have a hard time with. I'm like I'm such a go getter. It's like I'm an entrepreneur. This is what we do. It's like hey, let's go, 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 go. But it's such great wisdom to just stop and just renew, have your values, renew kind of who you are, where you want to go, before then pursuing your opportunity. So let, let's kind of hone in on that kind of specific kind of reset stage. And this is also part of a course that I am kind of launching that's that I'm launching that it's going to start in the day after Labor Day. We'll make sure to drop the link. Yeah, absolutely. So it's called reinvigorate your brand during a crisis. And it's all about kind of that reset stage and it's in three parts. And this is basically kind of what brand strategy, if you can boil brand strategy down into, into its fundamental kind of parts is these, uh, are these three things. Number one is to rem- remember, I think very important right now is to remember who you are. Remember kind of your superhero origin story. How did you become who you are and come to the place that you're at right now? Remember, that's the first, that's uh, step one. Step two is now to look forward and see where you want to go. To imagine, is to kind of ask the what if question. Where is this uh, kind of better place that you want to go, that you want to bring your business uh, towards? And then step three, now that you have your point eight, your starting point and kind of your end point, now going back to sort of the the, the internal GPS kind of a metaphor that you brought up in, in in the beginning. Now renew your set of values. Write that down. Write all of these three things down. And if you have a team, share it with them. And I think even better if you can do that exercise with them. And kind of with my course, this is what I'm offering kind of leaders to do is that you can sign up as an individual, or you can sign up as a as a team of two or three to do this together. But sometimes you just need, well, a nudge. Um, and other times you need someone to just tell you, say, hey, your superpower is actually this. Because you're just in your lane. You're kind of just really busy being great at whatever you're doing. And just don't, and you have your blinders on. You don't see what other people see. So so that's, a, I think, a very practical kind of, a, kind of takeaway. Whether or not you do my course, remember who you are, kind of define where you're going and write down how you set up values. I love it. Thank you. So what kind of uh, business owner or entrepreneur or founder should take this course? Because there are different so stages, this- right? From the micropreneurs to someone yeah. who wants to start to the Fortune 100 CEOs, right? So there's a huge gambit of uh, yeah. how this would get, who will get the most value. Perhaps that's a better question. I'm tempted to say everyone. And, and the reason for that is that the, the course is not designed as a set of, it's not designed as a set of case studies where you're studying what other people have done. What the course is designed to do is that you bring where you are, your business and, and your 
kind of sphere of influence, whether or not that's a team or that's you as a solo entrepreneur, you bring your business to the course and we will over two and a half weeks work through it and, and have clarity at the end of it, who you are, where you want to go and uh, your set of values. So it's, it's really kind of designed to be very, very much kind of industry agnostic, very much kind of even kind of like business size and not ag agnostic. But one thing that we are um, kind of focused on is that we are giving a, I think roughly a 45% off for anyone who is um, affected by COVID. Uh, so we'd love to be able to, you know, and this is kind of one of our values to be able to kind of serve people. Like that's as simple as that. Want to want to be able to serve others and have and pay it forward. So yeah, so we, we have a discount that's already on the website. And if you're affected by COVID, you are welcome to to click and select on the on, on the lower price point. The experience will be exactly the same as everyone else. But we'd love to be able to support those who are who needs more win in a sale. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So guys, we talked a lot about a wide range of different things. We had talked about the origin story of uh, Giant Shoulders. We had talked about his military experience. We had talked about standing for what you believe in. We had talked about how people remember not what you do or what you say, but how you make them feel. We had talked about the different experiments that you could do to, to test for the felt experience that is your brand. We had talked about the different mental models around measuring culture. Now we had talked about uh, Tino's framework in reinvigorating the brand from remember who you are to looking for or where you're going to, to what was it? The values, right? That you yeah. stand for, the strategy that you want to go and also share it with your and, and co-create it with your employees. And Tino has so generously shared with us a code for us to take his course. Anything else you want to say before we complete our chat, Tino? Um, well, keep on keeping on. I think especially in this time, remember to rest. I think this is the lesson that I have to painfully learn during this time. And leaders, we still need to put out fires. Can we, we, we sympathize and empathize with you? And remember to take care of yourself. Remember to rest. Don't leave with a cloudy mind. Leave with a clear mind. Beautiful. Thank you so much, my friend, for being so generous with your story, with your wisdom, with your strategies, and with your tactics. Appreciate you so much. Absolutely. Yeah, All thank right. you so much for inviting me.